We're going to take two weeks, two sets of PowerPoints to work our way through Chapter 8 and a little bit of Chapter 9. If you do your tax returns carefully, tax returns 6 and 7 are designed to give you a active introduction to itemized deductions and some of the credits that are alternative to deductions. So I've carved out interest and charitable contributions for this week's material for several reasons. The first of which is they are the most complicated material, the one that you will probably need a little more feedback from me on. Second, an understanding in this area will help you with Thelma's tax return. And third, it's a little bit more interesting what I have to say here. There's not much I can add to the fact that ad valorem taxes are deductible and federal income taxes are not. So if you will do your tax returns carefully and in a thoughtful manner, they will go a long way to giving you the background you need so that the next couple of weeks will give you a chance to catch your breath and focus on some other material, assuming, of course, that you are continuing to work on the tax returns and other things. Okay, there are several interest expense categories. It's important to know what the money was spent on that you borrowed in order to properly classify the interest expense. Some are deductible, some are not. An active trader business, that's Thelma, tax returns one, two, three, and four, where she's borrowing money for her business. This would generally not be a Schedule A item unless you had the very unique experience of an employee borrowing for an active trader business. And we just won't deal with it because it is not going to happen very often. So active trader business interest would, for the most part, be for AGI. It would be what a business does or what Thelma would do on her Schedule C or her partnership or S corporation. Qualified residence interest, we have slides coming up. The word qualified means that it is a subset of deductions that people would use to borrow to buy houses that make it deductible. So not all interest you borrow, all, not all monies you borrow to buy houses create qualified residence interest. So it's important to pay attention to the details. Investment interest, we got a bunch of slides for this. Uh, this will be the primary focus of the Blackboard quiz for this part of the material. We'll work slowly through those examples. You are guaranteed one on the test. Tax exempt interest, we already know, or you may know if you have read through the chapter six PowerPoints that we got snowed out on, that if you spend money to make money that will not generate taxable income, you do not have a tax deduction. So if you borrow money to buy muni bond interest, you do not have a tax deduction. Now this can be a little weird because if you borrowed money to buy stock that paid qualified dividends, and it turns out you had a zero tax rate on those dividends, that's not the same thing, right? Uh, there is a tax applied, it just happens to be zero if your marginal tax rate on ordinary income does not exceed uh, 15%. Consumer interest, that's just about everything we don't have listed here. That is all non-deductible and has been now since 1990. This does include things like you did not pay your taxes on time, so you had to pay interest on the underpayment. This is considered consumer interest, even if the majority of your tax return was your business. And then there's this category called passive trades or businesses. Uh, we will talk briefly about this in part three of the test. So you will not see this category on test two. However, if you borrow money to invest in this passive thing, or to run the passive investment, you would not have a deduction without running through the passive activity rules. And all that will make more sense later. All you need to know about passive is you don't have any sweat equity into the business. It's your money working, but not you. And we will define that at length in part three. So there are a couple limitations. First of all, it must be your debt. Uh, you cannot pay your son's debt and then take a interest deduction. Uh, if you are guaranteeing debt, you must uh, actually have been called to be a liable, not just I'm going to pay it so that I don't have to deal with it. And remember, we cannot deduct prepaid interest. Uh, all interest income is deemed to be earned on a daily basis, whether we receive cash or not. That's the OID rules from the first part of the test course. 
And the flip side is you cannot prepay interest. Interest is deemed to accrue on a daily basis. If you pay January's interest in December, you do not get a tax deduction until December, regardless of your method of accounting. All right, I mentioned earlier that you do need to know not only what you borrowed the money for, but the fact the money was actually spent on that particular item. So the government no longer thinks that um, money is fungible. If you borrow $10,000 and it was spent to buy muni bonds, no tax deduction on the interest, right? Because there's no income on it. If you borrowed the money to use in your trader business, would be active trader business income. The problem, of course, is you borrowed the money, but it covered your credit card bill before the check you wrote for the business property cleared. So it's always a good thing to separate out your business activities from your personal activities so that you have a nice clean trail should you be asked by the IRS. Now, interest expense limitations are based on how the funds were spent, and we've got a few slides coming up for that. Expense limitations for active trader businesses, there is really no limit to deductibility uh, as long as you can demonstrate that the funds were plowed back into your business. Investment interest, we've got slides coming up. Note the word net is bolded here. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to pool all your different kinds of investment income and you are going to reduce that by any related deductions. And then if there is anything left, that would be the maximum amount of interest expense that you could deduct. And what you cannot deduct this year will carry over indefinitely as long as you are still breathing and filing a Form 1040. So investment income is interest, including interest on tax refunds, any kind of dividends, whether they're qualified or not. But if you want to count them for this calculation, you have to give up the preferential rate. And then the same thing when we get to capital gains, you will see that they also have preferential rates some of the time. And so what we have in these two items are a choice. I can either take the deduction offsetting income that would have had a special tax rate, or I can defer the deduction to the future. And you can get into all sorts of complicated net present value calculations. If you have a, calc a taxpayer with deep pockets, and they believe that rates are going up in the future. They may feel that it's important to defer the deduction. Other people are living hand to mouth and the only answer they want is how little can I get away with paying this year? It's going to go on my credit card. It's going to cost me 26% interest. You got to keep that number small, please. So on the examples coming up, we're just going to use the word interest on tax return seven. Thelma has decided that it's important to minimize her overall tax deduction. And so she is going to give up the special tax rates in order to maximize her investment income deduction. But you'll have lots of check figures and we'll talk about it in class. So annuities or royalties that would also show up on your Schedule E, uh, those would be treated as investment income as long as they're not related to the active conduct of a trader business. And so if you look in your Pub 17 or your book, there's a laundry list of things that could count. When in doubt, check your index. Investment expenses are all the expenses related to the various categories of investment income. Remember, you're pooling interest and capital gains and royalties. So we look at each item and see if you'd incurred any expenses. Did you pay someone to manage your stock portfolio? Do you have a safety deposit box where you are keeping your bearer bonds? Did you deduct the Wall Street Journal because you're tracking your investments? Did you buy Kippinger's, other kinds of things that you said were expenses only because of your investment activity? You, uh, these would be miscellaneous 2% deductions. And as you'll see in the examples coming up, you only deduct what is an excess of the 2% reduction any kind of taxes or interest related to your investments would not be considered here. So net investment income is simply the excess of investment income over the investment expenses we discussed on the prior slide. Only when that is a positive number can you deduct any of the investment interest, money interest related to monies you borrowed in order to buy investment grade properties. So when we work through the examples, watch what's going on, watch the labels, investment income, investment expenses, 
investment interest expense are three separate items. You want to make sure that you've labeled your work all the way through so that you know what you have when you get done because you're literally going to go through three steps to get to the bottom line. All right, this is the first of three examples. Two of these examples you will see on the quiz. One of them you will see on the test. So I have to give you information. Uh, as you can see, the $20,000 is your interest expense on the monies that you borrowed to buy investment grade properties. This is what you're trying to deduct. If you look below that, your taxable income consists of wages, which are not investment income, and interest income, which is. So we're starting at with the potential to deduct no more than $8,500 of the $20,000. But before we can make that statement, we need to determine if we have any deductions relating to our investments. And you'll note towards the top of the slide that, in fact, here I've said there are no deductions relating to investments. We haven't paid broker's fees. We don't have a safety deposit box. We don't buy the Wall Street Journal. So we're good to go. So then your, the template on the next page will show you that we're going to take the $8,500, reduce it by zero because there are no deductions, and that will be the maximum amount of the $20,000 we can deduct. The excess becomes a carryover to prior to future period. So as we work through this slide, you'll note that we have defined the steps. The first thing is to define our investment income. We look at our Schedule B, our Schedule D, our Schedule E for uh, annuities and royalty income. And then we determine whether or not we have any related expenses net of the 2% rule because the only expenses we look at here will be the miscellaneous 2% deductions. In this case, there are none. And so our investment income is our net investment income. And so of the $20,000 that we spent on interest on various debt to cover our investment related property, we can deduct $8,500 and the remainder carries over to be used in future years. Now, as we move to example two, all of our numbers are the same, except we're going to add an expense. This expense will be a miscellaneous 2% deduction. So we have to determine whether or not any of it survives the 2% reduction. So we're going to pay $2,000 for management fees. And so on the next slide, uh, you will see that none of that will actually give you a tax deduction, which should not surprise you because the first 2% of your AGI subtracts from the 2000 and our AGI is over 100,000. So we should land up with a negative number. If negative, use zero. So here's the math. Our AGI is all of the income, which is the wages and the interest. 2% of that is 2170. And if you can envision your Schedule A here, you write down the $2,000 of management fees. You write down the 2170, which is your 2%. You subtract the 2170 from the 2000 if negative right zero. And so even though you spent $2,000, you got no benefit from the 2000. And so our answer to example two is going to look exactly like the example one, not because we didn't spend money on the management fees, but because we got no tax benefit from them. So we're not being penalized. So here we go. Still zero because the 2000 was less than the 2170. So our net investment income is 8500. That's how much of the interest we're deducting. And the rest is a carryover. So for our last example here, we start out with the same facts. We borrow, we borrow money, paid $20,000 worth of investment interest expense. We have wages and interest income. This time our management fees are a little more hefty. And so our 2% of AGI is still the 2170. So the 8,000 is larger than that. So we will have an item on our Schedule A that gives us benefit for part of the management fees. So we have to reduce the $8,500 by the remainder of the management fees. So you can see here it's still the 108,500. 2% is still 2170. But now when we subtract out from 8,000, we have $5,830 uh, as a Schedule A item that reduced our taxable income. So on the next slide, we're going to have to reduce the $8,500 by that in order to determine our net investment income. 
All right, so the last variation on our numbers, the same investment income, but this time our net investment income will be lower because we do have related expenses that reduce our taxable income. So now our $8,500 is only 2670. So of the 20,000, we're only going to be able to deduct that much because that's our net investment income limitation. And so the remainder will carry over to be used in future tax years. There are literally only two kinds of interest that can be deducted on your Schedule A. We just ran through the investment interest expense limitation. And now we're going to spend a few slides talking about your mortgage interest. Not everybody who pays them has a mortgage on their personal residence is going to get a deduction. It has to be qualified residence interest in order to take a deduction. And the rules are pretty straightforward. You cannot use more than two principal residences. So if you own six houses, you have to pick the two that you want to take a tax deduction on the interest for. The total acquisition indebtedness across those two houses cannot exceed a million dollars. And here we're looking at your original mortgage. So if I had a mortgage for $3,000, I could deduct one third of the interest because anything over one million would be disallowed. And as I pay that mortgage down, I would still be limited to paying one third of the interest each time. And then if I'm lucky enough to have some equity in my house, I can borrow out up to $100,000, use that money for anything, and take a tax deduction. Now remember, we have to follow the money. So if you borrowed money and you used it to take a Disney cruise, that would be consumer interest when you started paying it off. This rule trumps the normal tracking rule. So if you used your home equity to borrow out money to take a vacation, you could take a tax deduction on the equity interest expense as long as you had uh, you were under the 100,000. And we'll talk about this in length because it's also a alternative minimum tax adjustment. So what is qualified acquisition indebtedness? Well, it has to be a loan that is secured by the property. Uh, and it has to relate to the actual acquisition, building, or improving of the residence. So if you won the lottery and you paid off your mortgage and then you lost all your money and you had to borrow against your house, that would not be acquisition indebtedness. That would be equity indebtedness and you'd only be able to deduct the interest on the first $100,000. So I can build it from scratch. I can add a roof. I can add a swimming pool as long as the money gets plowed back into the actual bricks and mortar and the land. And you can only have the million dollars, uh, as we talked on the earlier slide, unless your house was purchased a long time ago. Uh, it used to be a totally unlimited deduction. When they brought the limit down to a million dollars, they grandfathered in all of the old residences. And as long as you didn't refinance, you could continue to whittle down uh, $3 million worth of debt if you were so lucky as to have that big house. Equity indebtedness, you borrowed the money out of your fair market value in excess of the debt you owe the bank at the time you incurred the debt. This is free money. You can spend it on anything you want and deduct the interest on up to the first $100,000 worth of debt. So you have to have some equity. And we're looking here at the time you take the loan, what is its appraised fair market value, and what at that point do you owe the bank? So if my house is appraised at $500,000 and I owe the bank $450,000, my equity is only $50,000. So if you're dealing with clients, you have to be careful here because banks will tend to lend more if you have really good credit. So they might lend me $75,000 because I got high class credit, but only $50,000 of that would be equity indebtedness because that's all the equity I have in my uh, house. So you always want to know fair market value and how much do I owe the bank at the date I'm taking out the loan. And then if it turns out your fair market value drops after that, you don't have to recalculate as long as it's the original loan. If you refinance, at the date of refinancing, you have to use the fair market value at that point. And you do not have to track the use of the money. You can use it for anything and take this deduction. Uh, but once again, all 
equity and acquisition indebtedness must be secured by the property. So whoever is loaning you the money must actually take out a formal lien on the property. If it's your grandma and she doesn't want to embarrass you by taking out a lien, then you don't have equity indebtedness. You just have a personal loan with non-deductible interest expense. And remember, we only get to deduct the interest on the first 100000 of equity that we borrowed. And this is an alternative minimum tax add back. So I've told you that there's only two kinds of interest you can deduct on your Schedule A, your mortgage interest and your investment interest expense. And I also told you that you cannot deduct prepaid interest. And now I'm about to tell you that there is a circumstance when you can deduct your prepaid interest. Uh, when you take out a loan, um, many people will pay points, which will reduce their stated interest rate. And so at their final essence, points are simply prepaid interest. I gave the bank $3,000 today so that they will charge me 4.5% instead of 4.75%. Always been accepted as prepaid interest. Always been deductible on the right set of circumstances. It right? has to be points on the acquisition, uh, on your acquisition debt to related to the purchase of a principal residence, not business property. And the, generally, the lender wants you to pay these things up front. They don't want you to borrow the money to reduce the interest payment. Uh, so uh, the IRS has always taken the position that if you borrow money from the lender, you don't have any basis till you paid it back. So if they did land up, uh, your mortgage was uh, 100000 plus the 3000 you financed everything, you would not have a current deduction because you had no skin in the game. So what we have then is sellers who want you to close and they're willing to either reduce the selling price by 3000 or pay your points. Right? And you want the points to get the lower interest rate and that check has to be there at the uh, table when you close. And so a lot of times sellers will say, all right, instead of reducing your purchase price, I will pay for your points. And for a long time, the IRS took the position that you had no skin in that game either, right? It was not your money. And so uh, taxpayers would go through a lot of convoluted hoops to try to prove that the $3,000 was truly theirs, not the seller's. And so 15, 20 years ago, the IRS decided that was a waste of resources. So as long as somebody other than the bank ponies up the cost for the points, the owner, the new owner of the property can take a tax deduction. Uh, there are not deductible if it is a rental property or other business property or if you are refinancing. So if you paid points on a refinancing, that has to be amortized. So note, ND stands for non-deductible, but by that I mean you cannot deduct 100% of it. Instead, you get a little bit each year for the 30 years of the loan.